Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start here shortly. My name is Alex. On behalf of Idea Lab, I'd like to welcome you all to our first of our monthly Big Idea Speaker Series. Uh, tonight, we're pleased to have Brock Pierce here talking about virtual currencies and gambling. So, Brock, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. All right, thanks, Alex. How's everyone doing? Good, good. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Brock here. Uh, we've been paneling many times before, and for those of you who don't know him, uh, Brock is a serial entrepreneur, best known for pioneering the market for virtual currency and online games. Uh, he founded IGE, the world's biggest retailer of uh, World of Warcraft gold coins and other virtual currencies. And before that, the, dare I say, dot-com blowout digital entertainment network. Uh, and since then, he's become one of the most famous and influential figures in online gambling or in the online gambling community. He's currently executive chairman of Playcino, which I'll have you explain what you guys do uh, in a little bit and Managing Director of Clearstone uh, Global Gaming Fund, uh, which has an idea, uh, idea Lab connection to, that I'll let you explain. And he sits on the boards of um, Xfire, Five Delta, Evertune, and Spicy Wars Games. Uh, does that about sum it up? It's about half of it. <laughs> <laughs> Bios are old. Who's got time to update them? So, Brock, you're currently very focused on social casino gaming or iGaming. Um, how would you describe virtual currency as it relates to gaming? Because it's a little different. You're talking about virtual currencies that you can use to, to buy real uh, goods and services. Two buckets, for. very simple. Yeah. Uh, you've got closed systems which would be the early emerging currencies would be loyalty programs, things like uh, uh, frequent flyer miles, American Express points. Uh, those were some of the early sort of emergence of, you know, kind of events where digital currencies were produced. And those were closed systems that were used within that closed network. Uh, games are very similar in that sense. The virtual currency that you've bought or acquired is used within that game. And there may be secondary markets for those things, but think of all of those as a closed system. Uh, something like Bitcoin, for example, is, uh, is an open system where you can transact beyond the system that it's intended to be used for. Right, okay. So, you know, what, could you explain a little bit, you know, we're calling these speaker series big ideas. What, what do you think is the big idea behind virtual currencies or virtual economies, if you have it? Well, uh, from a closed perspective, uh, it created a, a business model uh, that has you know, fundamentally changed the entire games industry. I started, uh, it was in 1997, I was playing an online game called Sanctum, which was a, um, a collectible card game that met, kind of meets chess. If you're familiar with Magic the Gathering or Pokemon or any of these card type games, uh, they had basically brought that online with a, with a board game sort of component. And I was playing this game and I said, I think there's a, an opportunity for uh, sort of a secondary market. If you went into a baseball card store or a comic book store at the time, you had the ability to buy singles because the packs were sold and the cards that you were receiving were random. And you may not want to have to buy a thousand packs to get that one particular card that you need. So I contacted the game company. I was 17 at the time. I said, hey, uh, I'd like to basically take the analog model and apply it to your business. Uh, I'd like to buy your, your packets of cards in bulk and I'd like to be able to have the right to sell them on an individual basis. So I went ahead and I set up this little business and I guess the point at the time was just because the, uh, the asset was intangible didn't make it any less valuable, uh, which was I think a novel idea at the time. And it was because it did the same thing that any physical sort, if your hobby is golf for example, it had the same, it provided you the same uh, either utility, it enhanced your life in some way or it improved your social status much in the same way people want to drive fancy cars. So that was where I first recognized that intangible objects were no less valuable. Uh, I'd started that, that flop that you were referring to, which then took up all my time. Uh, but, you know, I guess there were many back then. And, uh, and then I went back to that business uh, and said, uh, uh, I think that people are that are playing these games uh, want to buy virtual currency, they want to buy virtual goods. And uh, at the time, there were no game companies at the time selling them. And, and this kind of led to a, a sequences of events that were 
uh, where the model essentially changed. The video game industry has gone from uh, being a packaged software business where you, know, you buy a product, you play with it, you use it maybe once, maybe a thousand times, and every user is getting that, you know, that's paying that same exact cost to where it's shifted to a more a software as a service and freemium model, which is give that content away, uh, make sure that that content is compelling, and find ways to upsell that customer into, uh, into product. And, and virtual currency was good in that way. Uh, if you take a look at the, uh, uh, the app stores today in mobile, uh, when apps were first being released, they were all essentially paid download, you know, a dollar or five dollars an app. And you're now seeing uh, the in-app purchasing market, which is where you've got the ability to buy, you know, virtual currency or virtual goods to uh, uh, expand or improve your gameplay, uh, where that is now going to be a majority of mobile revenue that's being generated. And that's in an environment where 95 to 98 percent of your customers are never paying you anything. What you've done is you can say, I can give this product away to everyone, and I will take as much money from that customer as they're willing to part with. Uh, so instead of a customer that was willing to pay you $10,000, but you limited them to one, you've now given them the ability to you know, buy as much as they want. And so the games industry has shifted you know, fundamentally, with the exception of console, to this model. You know, it's freemium, give it away, and, and make money on the, the upsell, and extract as much money as you can. And I think what's changed, too, is consumers, we're not so willing to uh, uh, just part with our money without having tried something first. Uh, and when you're competing with that model as someone that's trying to sell a product up front, uh, it's difficult to compete with. Though in some ways I think that there may, to some degree, there's going to be a reverse trend. I don't know if anybody followed, but uh, Apple changed their algorithms just recently in the, uh, what they call the top grossing category. Uh, and part of that was to eliminate the game companies that were, reducing, that were producing really high revenues and actually allow the Pandoras of the world uh, to rise through the ranks. No one's quite cracked what it is, but I think what they're doing is eliminating maybe the, uh, the outlying customers and then averaging it from there. Mm. Uh, we'll, someone will figure out uh, uh, how the algorithm was changed sometime over the next few weeks. Probably not tell anyone about it, <laughs> figure out how to game it. And, uh, but, uh, so that would be kind of what's happened in the games industry. And you're seeing more of these, uh, uh, and then secondary markets, which is what I had done at the time. I was making a market. So uh, for me to sell a virtual currency inside of a game in the early 2000s when no game company sold them, I was actually buying them off of other people playing games. So if you had too much time on your hands, uh, you may have accumulated more virtual currency or virtual goods than you actually needed. These might be virtual swords or shields and things of this nature in World of Warcraft. And then there would be somebody else that lacked the discretionary time uh, to get the things that they want but had the expendable income. And so I made a market uh, and buying and selling uh, essentially these virtual currencies in games. The problem I had was there were far more Westerners uh, that wanted to buy virtual currency than there were Westerners that wanted to sell it. So I ended up going over to Asia and building a supply chain of 400,000 people that would play games professionally uh, to sell me virtual currency to then sell into the Western markets. And, and th th that's actually interesting because I remember you have some anecdotes about that. And there were actually you know, physical gangs in, in these virtual worlds who would be robbing other people of their virtual goods, right? Well, when I went into Korea, my life was threatened a bunch of times. I was young and probably didn't care too much and <laughs> said, bring it on, but um, I'd gone into Korea and they, it was essentially at the time, uh, again, early adopters of technology often, and if you follow things like Bitcoin today, you'll see a lot of sort of negative publicity associated with things like uh, the Silk Road, and actually Jeremy Liu from Lightspeed uh, Ventures made a very cool posting uh, uh, this morning talking about what percentage of uh, drugs are actually being purchased with Bitcoin. It's about a half a percent. And when you compare that against something like the U.S. dollar, where 90 percent of bills have cocaine on them, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> when you actually start to compare the use of you know, currency and... Is that actually a verified fact? I, I, I read it somewhere on the internet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it must be true. So it must be true, right? <laughs> I read it on the internet. But uh, yeah, Jeremy had a good point. Relative to other currencies, there may actually be less, you know, sort of illicit, you know, activity occurring there. Uh, I'm not saying that's the case, but so, so so let's step back a bit because I don't know how familiar you all are with 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 Bitcoin. It's it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, right? So can you explain a little bit how that works? Uh, I mean, why does the currency fluctuate so much, and and why is it so controversial? Um, well. Con well, the I'll give you the first answer. So Bitcoin is a, uh, a decentralized currency. Think of uh, like BitTorrent and a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network uh, where, where files are being transferred. Instead, you have people that are adding computers to the, uh, to the Bitcoin network. Uh, and the original incentive for doing that was that uh, you produced Bitcoin by 
you know, if you add a, join a peer-to-peer -peer network, you're getting access to files. You join the Bitcoin network, you're bolstering the network itself, and in exchange for it, the, the network is rewarding you in Bitcoin. They call this Bitcoin mining. Uh, so it's a decentralized uh, network of computers that are all supporting this digital currency, which is just uh, just code, and people are, and it's limited. There'll only be 21 million of them, so it's a, a finite currency, and it's deflationary in some some sense in that regard. And you've got a lot of early adopters that said, I have more confidence in a currency that is, you know, supported by a million, of peop a million people like me than I do my government. I think that that's not ultimately where this goes. But that was kind of the early adopters of uh, uh, Bitcoin. And it actually didn't do much for a long time. Bitcoin's been around for years. And uh, it started to take off. And I was having a conversation in here earlier, uh, 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 call it a, a year and a half, two years ago. And then the first Bitcoin exchange got hacked and all the Bitcoins got stolen and Bitcoin crashed again. And then it's been on, on a, a pretty heavy rise and it's run all, all the way up to about $300 a Bitcoin and then came crashing down to, uh, call it $65 only about a month ago and we're trading at about $110, $111 probably this minute. And so it floats. It's a currency that is priced based upon supply and demand. If there's more people that want to, there's a bid and ask system. And uh, uh, certain events that are occurring, uh, the big run-up was uh, uh, associated with the, uh, uh, the banking crisis in Cyprus, where people chose to uh, move their money into Bitcoin as a form of storing value as an alternative to gold. In some ways, you can think of Bitcoin as kind of being gold 2.0. Uh, its, its, its core function is more of in being a, uh, as an American, it's really for stored value, because we've got very mature banking uh, and payment sort of infrastructure. Yes, it's, there's some some benefits in terms of efficiencies and fees uh, that make it uh, better in some ways. Some people would argue anonymity, though. I don't really think there's, Bitcoin is not really anonymous. Uh, imagine if I had a dollar bill and passed it to you, and every transit, and then I, that bill was signed, that this transaction was conducted, and that bill got passed around. Every transaction that occurs with a Bitcoin is permanently recorded. Uh, maybe not my identity directly associated with it, but in the same way that you thought you would post things on the internet five or ten years ago and that might not ever be tracked back to you, <laughs> at some point pretty much every Bitcoin transaction is going to be uh, uh, connected back to an individual. Uh, so anonymity is actually not its real use case, but that's where a lot of the sensational sort of press comes from. But in the U.S., again, it's more of a means of stored value. It's more of a means of uh, speculative investment. Uh, but in the emerging markets, take Indonesia, for example, where only 17% of the population uh, is banked. Uh, it's an incredibly useful tool. Um, but you know, you're you're talking got about it as a, as a peer to peer network. Let's, let's explain this uh, a little bit because I'm also a little bit confused about it. So, this was created by uh, someone under a, a, Naka, uh, under a Japanese Sudanian. name, right? That you don't actually know who it is. So, we don't know who created this. And uh, it has been hacked some, once. Some people do. And some people probably do, right? But not the general public. And it has been hacked once. And uh, you know why are we putting our, our trust into this? Are you saying that the Bitcoin protocol yeah. has never been hacked? Uh, what's been hacked are companies that exist within the Bitcoin economy. So no one owns Bitcoin. I mean, individuals. We all own Bitcoin if you choose to buy them or you choose to mine them. But uh, Bitcoin is an open source piece of software that's you know distributed across all the computers in the world that have chosen to participate within the network, and then those people that have chosen to hold on to Bitcoin. No one owns it. No one controls it. Uh, you know, shutting down Bitcoin is, you know, unplug the internet. Right. It's like trying to stop piracy. Uh, yeah, even harder. Because <laughs> ultimately there's individuals behind it. This is something that's been uh, just kind of released open source. You'd have to, everyone would have to stop using it, which there are reasons why that may occur. Right. Uh, mostly that, you know, is Bitcoin the Friendster, the MySpace, or the Facebook? Right. Uh, you know, at the time, each of those looked like they were the successful one. You know, Bitcoin is clearly the one that's got the, uh, the market sort of awareness and uh, adoption and momentum. And, uh, but like all things, there are some fundamental flaws as well. Uh, but hacking is probably not it. I was actually spending about an hour on the phone today contemplating how would one hack Bitcoin. Uh, uh, it'll be a while before it would be possible. Uh, ultimately, the equipment that's being produced to mine Bitcoin would be probably the main way that one would do it, which is you're building uh, technology that's meant to hash uh, really, really efficiently. And uh, you know, you're building up the ability to solve uh, uh, these mathematical problems at a rate that you know, we've never had networks of computers that could do this like this other than with maybe the NSA. Right. So if you just continue on, on talking a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, I think it's interesting. If you look at online uh, gaming, 
it's really one of the global uh, industries in the sense that people are, are, are downloading games and playing subscription games all over the world, right? So these gaming companies need to be able to collect money from Russia, from uh, Venezuela, from the US, from Europe, right? So they need to handle all these different currencies. Uh, so does that, does Bitcoin eliminate some of the friction in this system for them and make it easier so that they, they are uh, encouraging the use of, of those systems also because to cut out the middlemen who are also taking money like that? Oh, I, absolutely. Companies? If you take, you know, payments and we, you know, if we went back in time and, you know, where transactions were conducted with cash, if you sold me a good or service and I gave you money, uh, what fees did you pay? You paid nothing. Right. Uh, how long did it take for you to get that money? It was instant. Right, yeah. If I changed my mind and I wanted it back, could I make a phone call and have that money sent back to me? No. Most of the uh, electronic payment systems we have today were actually built you know, to protect consumers. And ultimately, merchants you know, have, you know, now you're paying somewhere between 2 and maybe even 10%. And if you were looking at mobile carriers, there was a time where you would pay a 50% fee uh, for, a, for a transaction. So you're paying fees of, call it 2 to 4% on average. Uh, transaction, when I actually buy that good or service from you now, you don't get your money immediately. You may get it a week later. You may get it a month later. You know, you may get it 45 days later if you know you're getting it from Apple. Uh, and then you also have the problem where maybe 10% of those funds are held back because it's a card not present transaction, for example. And there's what's called a rolling reserve, which you're not getting that money for about six months. And five months from now, if I decided that uh, uh, I want to complain and say that transaction didn't occur, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to get my money back too. So uh, uh, what Bitcoin offers a merchant, and there's many reasons why it's also good for consumers, is that when I make a transaction with you, you're getting that money instantly. Uh, fees are de minimis, a fraction of what they would be otherwise, and it's irreversible. Right. So, so I mean, there's a lot, from a merchant perspective, every merchant should be accepting Bitcoin. And there's a company here in LA uh, that's a payment gateway for Bitcoin called GoCoin, and everyone should be using GoCoin. <laughs> And I heard that there's a cupcake company in San Francisco. Yes, I was having a, a meeting with Tom, and that's his wife's company yesterday. Right, right. Yeah. So there's some brick and mortar stores that are starting to accept it too, which is you're seeing uh, especially in San Francisco. But the, the demographic there might be a little. Scary. You're seeing thousands of merchants a month enabling Bitcoin as a as a form of payment. I mean, as a as a merchant, it checks every possible box you could want. There's absolutely no reason to say no because it also provides one other thing another way of collecting money from consumers that want to give it to you. Right. Uh, and as a, as a merchant, you're always trying to find more ways to accept payment. Right. Do we have any questions about Bitcoin before? Uh, well, so take a, a, a GoCoin, for example, or a, a BitPay or any of the companies that are providing a, a, merge, a, a payment gateway. Uh, typically, you'd work with one of those businesses. They're going to provide you with an API that is as easy to integrate as something like PayPal. And it's going to allow that customer to see the price point in real time because Bitcoin fluctuates. You know, it's, it's highly volatile, as we were uh, just commenting on. So it'll say, OK, this is 9.99, or it's you know, point, uh, 0.8 Bitcoins. And then that consumer would pay at that point with Bitcoin, but not to you directly. It's the company that's servicing it would then collect the Bitcoin and then be responsible for exchanging it and passing on that fiat currency, US dollar most likely, to you, probably with a 1% uh, transaction fee, which is a fraction of what you'd the be paying with any other. In order to trust GoCoin more than American Express? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, you have to get comfortable that whoever's providing that service is, you know, uh, you know, you're, you, ultimately, yeah, typically that company has got enough you have to value that they're creating. The in the same way people talked about gambling for the long time. Well, are they rigging the numbers? Typically not. Because the value that that business is creating and growing that business is far greater than you know, the you know, $10,000 they're likely to steal from you. Great. All right, so let's move on because we only have limited time here. Let's talk a little bit about online gambling. So. It's pretty self-explanatory what it is, right? It's, it's traditional gambling such as poker, casino, sports betting, lotteries being done online through certain websites. Most of them not legal in the United States yet. That's that pretty much. No, you have legal gambling on the internet here in the United States today. And when I say gambling is legal in 48 states today in America, in some form, what is gambling? Lottery tickets. Right. You know, horse racing, you know, broadly defined gambling is everywhere but Hawaii and Utah. Um, in terms of internet gambling in the way that we think of it, slots, bingo, poker, 
Uh, it's legal in one state today and actually live and happening. We just hit the you know, 10 millionth hand that was played on what's called Ultimate Poker, which is the uh, Fertitas Brothers were the first to launch in Nevada. So uh, uh, what you've been seeing happen over, well, what happened is this is a post-global financial crisis issue. Western governments were broke, looking for new sources of revenue, and this was a natural place to go get it because you also get to double tax it. Not only do you have regular income tax, but like tobacco and other things, there's an additional tax that's uh, uh, placed on, on this sort of industry. And so uh, governments naturally got behind uh, the legalization or liberalization of gambling laws. And then the casinos themselves, due to the global financial crisis, were finding you know, their businesses suffering. Uh, and all, not just from you know, consumers having less money to gamble, but also because you were having more and more casinos springing up in each of these areas, so also due to competition. And so they've seen this now as an opportunity for themselves. So the two constituencies that have the sort of lobbying muscle to legalize internet gambling, for the most part, had agreed that this is a good thing to happen. So you've got uh, Nevada, this past legislation, legalizing what's called intrastate gambling only within the state of Nevada. You need to be a Nevada citizen and you need to be within, you know, the In four walls. In-state online gambling. Yeah. So that means only Nevada residents gamble. And you have to be within the four walls of, of Nevada. And those companies time. need to be set up in Nevada then? Yeah, well, not just the companies. All of the licenses are uh, only going to existing land-based operators. There's no internet entrepreneur that's going to be starting up an internet casino anytime soon out of Idea Lab or any incubator. Uh, there's ways to make money within that ecosystem, but the incumbent in any given state is the only one that's getting licensed. So in Nevada, that's the casinos. In New Jersey, that's the casinos. Delaware, which has also legalized it, it's the state lottery and the three casinos that are sub-licensed to by the state of Delaware. Uh, you know, in California, it'll be the, uh, the Indian tribes and the card clubs. Uh, so the incumbents are you know, controlling the process naturally, and they're the only ones that are going to be receiving the licenses. Um, so in so the state of Nevada, that, you have to be a, a, a casino owner. But, uh, what about the, but what about the European companies? I mean, if you go to any European country right now, you'll see you know, all, all the walls pretty much having one online gambling, sports betting, uh, advertisement. I mean, it's it's huge. In the right? UK, especially, it's the most liberal country in the world when it came to, to gambling. Right. So those kind of companies went. must be really powerful, right? And why wouldn't it be so easy just to open up well, uh, here you're, in the US? And you're, you're competing in somebody else's territory where you've got very influential incumbents. Um, so in Europe, the the incumbents did not end up controlling. Uh, 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 the legislative process and ensuring that only they receive licenses. So yeah, Europe developed very differently, and you've been seeing the same trend occur over there. But you know, inter it's it's still a highly regulated industry, so you have to go through the process of getting a license. Um, and in Europe, you'd typically be getting a license in Isle of Man, the UK, uh, uh, um, Alderney, Malta, uh, Gibraltar. Um, so you have a, a gambling has been being liberalized there, but over here, no, it's uh, existing incumbents. But what's happening is, if you take the state of Delaware, uh, the largest provider of uh, you've got the two big lottery providers in the U.S. One is called Scientific Gaming, uh, the other is GTEC. So Scientific Gaming partnered up with 888, which is a very successful Israeli internet gambling company that had the internet infrastructure, and said, let's go through the RFP process in the state of Delaware, presenting to the casinos and the state lottery, saying we'd like to be your third-party vendor that's powering you, and they end up winning that, uh, uh, that RFP bidding against uh, Bally and Shufflemaster. So they are finding a way in, but it has to be through the form of partnership. There are a lot of ways and a lot of value that will be created here over the next five or ten years as internet gambling uh, uh, occurs. I mean, it, it, just think about gambling in terms of you've got uh, consumer demand that far exceeds product availability. Uh, when that becomes available, naturally, it's going to be a very big business very quickly. Take marketing companies, for example. Uh, the marketing companies in Europe that are driving customers into the internet gambling companies today are generating about $10 billion a year. So you're going to have a $10 billion a year market uh, just in providing marketing services to, uh, uh, to internet gambling operations as you know, the U.S. Open up, opens up and matures. Right. It won't be that overnight, naturally. So, I mean... We're seeing so much innovation in this space too, partly because that there's so much money involved, right, in, in, in online gambling. And some of the interesting companies that I've seen are, are the companies that are building businesses on top of uh, gaming platforms, right? So basically message systems and stuff where you can be playing uh, an online game 
with your friend on your Xbox, whatever, and then message them like, "Want to make this interesting? Ten bucks that I win this game, or ten bucks that I..." Well, I'm I'm doing that today. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, this was one of the areas. So I, I took a look, kind of at gambling, saying, "I think gambling is going to become legal in the U.S. and this is 2009, 2010." You know, what are the ways that I'm going to be able to make money off this? I eliminated most of the ideas because they required, uh, as much as I wanted to make a bet on gambling, I didn't want to bet on when the government was going to do something. Um, <laughs> could be a long wait. And uh, so I said, what are all the businesses that are great businesses today that will be big beneficiaries of that legislative event or those legislative events as, as it's being? Uh, one was uh, social casino games. This is, uh, if you're familiar with Zynga Poker, you're putting casino style games onto social and mobile and web platforms. Uh, and the business model is selling virtual currency. Gambling is defined as ki consideration, you paid something, chance, the outcome is completely random, uh, or m almost entirely random, and there's reward, you're winning something. If any of those three do not exist, it's not considered gambling. It's the reason why you see sweepstakes, uh, things like you know, the Monopoly game, uh, and that's what's called alternative form of entry, long, long sort of conversation so around the nuances. the difference between skilled, gamble, skilled yeah. gaming and unskilled gaming, right? So I'm gonna walk you, walk you through that. So the idea is you put games uh, into the market that are casino style in nature, they appeal broadly, aggregate an audience that's enormous with a virtual currency based business, and when gambling becomes legal, who has all the users that the casinos are going to need to acquire from? It's going to be these social casino games companies. Companies like Zynga are likely going to be big, big beneficiaries as a result of having that you know, ginormous sort of poker audience. Uh, so that's on the one hand. The other thing that I looked at and got very interested in is this nuance of what's considered skill based gaming. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, Direct TV is actually a very big player in this space today. Uh, uh, Liberty Media acquired a company called World Winner and a company called Skill Jam. They consolidated those businesses, merged it into GSN, which then got you know, merged into, uh, into Direct TV. And what they do, and they've been doing for about 10 years, is allow you to go online, start playing Bejeweled in the US for real money today. And that's been going on for quite some time now. If you've heard of Candy Crush Saga, uh, uh, King.com, the company that made that was also in that same business for the last 10 years. Both of those companies migrated into social and mobile games, but this is a model that's been around for a long time. It kind of capped out at a billion or two billion dollars a year of wagers, uh, and therefore they went looking for other new emerging, emerging businesses. But an area where no one had actually done this before and where I think the market opportunity was large was around hardcore games where the players are you know, highly competitive. Most of us don't get too competitive with our Bejeweled and Tetris, though there clearly is a niche as I just <laughs> described it. Um, but around Counter-Strike, League of Legends, games of this nature, uh, you'll see highly competitive people and there's this, uh, this concept of eSports, which is one of the hottest things that's kind of emerging within the, uh, uh, the gaming industry. You know, big competition, celebrities, it's been big in Korea and China for ages. Which, if you're is, a great, not, which is not like fantasy football, right? This is no, if you're, a, uh, if you're a great StarCraft player uh, in Korea six years ago, uh, Instead of when you turned on your TV show, when you turned on your TV, you wouldn't see a, 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 something like American Idol. What you would see is two people playing a heads-up match of StarCraft. Prime time, you know, main broadcast channel, you know, television type programming. Because um, it was this popular. And if you were a great StarCraft player, you would be making millions of dollars a year in sponsorships. No different than if you played a professional sport. So they're called eSports. Uh, competitive gaming, and it's taken a while for this to take hold in the U.S. But it's, you know, it's, it's become a, a very big thing. Uh, uh, sort of globally. So I said, look at internet poker. Uh, does anyone have a guess how many people around the world play internet poker for money? The entire world, how many people play internet poker for money online? It's, about, it's between five and 10 million people. So it's actually not a very big market in terms of you know, people. Uh, Party poker, when they went public, had a $13 billion market cap. When uh, uh, Poker Stars today, which is now the largest in the world, if they didn't have problems with the U.S. government, they'd probably be worth about 10 or 20 billion today. They generate about a billion a year of free cash. So in a market where you've got, call it, 5 million people in the world, you can create 10 plus billion of value. So I said, well, this is interesting. Let's take poker as a business model and layer it over the entire video game industry. Because there's more than 5 million people around the world that'll play Call of Duty, Counter-Strike, League of Legends, and games of this nature. Uh, for money and competitively. So I went and uh, acquired a platform that had built the infrastructure for doing this and then I spun a company called Xfire out of Viacom. They had dumped a couple hundred million dollars into, uh, into this business but never figured out a business model. Um, so I was able to cut a good deal and ultimately now after two years we go live uh, in September for Play Money and we'll do real money sometime in the first half of next year.
Yeah, that's a really interesting model, and also builds upon what's what's been happening a lot in Europe, which is people are betting on live sports, right? Don't, but they're online; it's not coming through the television. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, sports is, uh, and it's funny when you go country to country, what's kind of considered good gambling and bad gambling. Yeah. Uh, in the U.S., sports betting is considered the worst form of gambling. Uh, but most everywhere else in the world, it's considered the, the most moderate form of gambling, which right. is but kind of interesting, depending upon where you are. In Russia, betting on sports is legal. Yeah. You know, in Ukraine, betting on sports is legal. Playing poker and slots and you know, things of that nature, no way, that's horrible stuff. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned Zynga and their online casino efforts, but they recently pulled back from that. Uh, so well, what does that indicate? Well, I don't think they pulled back. I think that uh, they made a, a very smart decision. Uh, they never went full bore into the market, uh, which means they didn't develop the platform, and building a gambling platform is actually quite expensive, uh, and it requires some time, so they didn't have the platform or technology needed. They didn't have the team necessary to get into the business, and they were struggling to get the, get the licenses and kind of the market's already moving. Nevada's online. Uh, Delaware and New Jersey goes online later this fall. Uh, Zynga had no possible way of catching up to compete directly in the real money gaming space in the U.S. Uh, so it was smart to abandon that effort. It doesn't mean they're not going to be big beneficiaries of that event for the reasons I've said. They've got the audience. Yeah. And if you take a look at the value chain of the gambling sector, about 20% of the economics that are at relatively low margin go to the content providers and the, uh, call it the plumbing, uh, the actual right. back-end systems and payments. About 50% of the revenue goes to the, um, to the actual operator, and they generate about a 30% margin. But that last 30%, that $10 billion I was referring to, goes to the marketing companies that have between typically a 50 to 70 percent margin. Zynga is going to be the beneficiary of what is the juiciest you know, piece of the market. Yeah. All right, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you one question about entrepreneurship too, as I mentioned earlier. Could you explain a little bit about uh, Clearstone Global Gaming Fund, its, its history, and kind of what companies you're looking for? Uh, so I know games, gambling, and Digital currency; those are kind of the areas where I've got expertise, and most of what I do from an investment perspective are, you know, in the areas I understand. I also do some infrastructure, so ad tech, payments, you know, things that I naturally got to know as a result of building businesses in in those other spaces. Um, so, uh, you know, we're a, a fund that uh, focuses on you know, the segments that I know. Okay. Do we have any questions for Brooke? Over here. In the sports gambling, do you think we'll get to the point here in the U.S. <clears throat> first with virtual currency, then with real money, where it's like betting balls and strikes mid-game, that sort of thing, like the you know real-time gambling? What well, real-time gambling? Is no, there, there's a, there's a space I'm, I'm I'm fond of, and there's even a few companies here in L.A. that are focused on it. There's a new thing that's come out that's called uh, daily fantasy. So wagering on fantasy sports has historically been legal. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, you are contributing funds into your fantasy sports league, and if you end up winning at the end of the season, you got the prize pool. So people said, well, if, if sports betting is illegal in the U.S., what if we take that season-long event and let's compress it to a day? You know, let's compress it to a game. You're essentially getting a, a similar result, but it's being done through a peer-to-peer -peer sort of fantasy sports-based uh, platform. Comcast just invested a bunch of money in... Uh, um, Yeah, uh, not draft picks. That's DraftKings. not DraftKings. That was uh, one of the venture funds, but uh, one of the other ones. A FanDuel, uh, FanDuel. So I mean, this is a, an interesting space, and the businesses that are uh, uh, operating that sector are growing like crazy. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting space if you're you find that area interesting. So are you are you suggesting like in the future that these games like Call of Duty, Halo, which track like see numerous audiences and the games cost hundreds of millions of dollars to create? You can actually create a system where these 15 year olds who are you know, playing online all the time can actually go, I'm not this level, you're this level, let's put five bucks on it and see the win. And you're going to get no kickback from Microsoft or the makers of these games that you're having teenagers. We wouldn't be taking let, bets. Let me, let me just repeat. You wouldn't be taking yeah. bets from, from minors. Let me just repeat the question. So, yeah, so the, que the question yeah. is uh, wagering on games. Are the platforms going to be supportive of this? And uh, you know, are the game companies going to be supportive of it? Um, and you know, what are the things that you need to do to you know, uh, operate that business in, in a responsible uh, 
Yeah, well, in, in terms of being responsible, yeah, naturally you're, you're not going to let minors participate in, in such a program, so you're going to run users through sort of age verification programs, and you're naturally going to also be focused on geolocation because the skill gaming, the federal government says skill-based gaming is legal, and then it's up to the states to make those decisions, and it's not legal in every state. So naturally you're going to be doing geolocation as well. Uh, in terms of the platforms, the, the other big company that's making a, a run in this market but with a focus on console, I'm focused on PC, is uh, Virgin Gaming. So Richard Branson's got a group called Virgin Gaming. They just raised uh, you know, another $20 million from Fidelity at a $100 million valuation, and they're directly integrated into the Xbox. So Microsoft is integrated in, into their systems. They've got deals with Electronic Arts. Um, so yes, the platform providers and yes, the game makers you know, are, call it, generally supportive of what's going on, and you've got some of the earlier platforms and, and, and publishers or developers that have jumped in and you know over time you'll see more and more do it if their content uh, you know appeals to you know this type of audience these are you know highly competitive games final and that's questions. where this works final question where uh, where will we be launching so what uh, where will your audience be based on your uh, we're launching in uh, in Brazil uh, we have a, a partner down there that's putting 10 million dollars of sort of marketing support behind it and has you know, call it pretty incredible distribution in the region. Uh, so that'll be uh, uh, next month, and then, uh, and then we'll be bringing it here. Great. Well, uh, let's give a round of applause for Brock, and uh, <laughs> thank you so much.